Okay, good. So uh, that was, you know, in 70s, people were thinking about that. And then 80s, people were trying to like, you know, generalize these ideas further. And they came up with uh, the following definition. So here is going to be the main definition slide. And it's a complicated definition, no doubt about it. So get ready. It's a, a, ultimately the definition of the tree width of a general graph. Okay, so let's have you say you have some general graph G, like this one shown on the left. I mean, forget about the fact that it happens to be a series parallel graph with terminals F and D. Just think of it as some graph. So I'm going to define for you what is a, quote, tree decomposition of such a graph G. So a, a tree decomposition is itself a tree, T, where the vertices of the tree are called bags. And uh, I'll use the notation X for a bag. Okay, and I will now show you uh, the a tree decomposition T for this graph G over here. So this T is my tree decomposition. Uh, these vertices are the circles, so they're, they're bags because you see they have letters in them, and those letters are names of vertices from G. Okay, and there are two rules uh, for this tree decomposition T. First of all, for every edge in the original graph, like okay, here's an edge between E and G, uh, then E and G have to be together in at least some one bag. So we have to look over here and find it. And like, here it is. Here's the bag that has E and G together in it. Okay. Uh, or what's another edge? Uh, I don't know. Um, DG, that's another edge here. So there has to be at least some bag that has a D and a G in it. And actually, we've got a couple. This one has it, and this one has it. So that's rule one. And rule two is for every vertex in uh, the graph, the bags that contain it must form like a connected subtree of T. So let's look at that rule again as well. We can take some vertex like B. And uh, okay, what? It, uh, whoops. I just hit it. Uh, Uh, like here's B, this is not too great. Here's B, and here's B, and here's B. Okay, I thought that would be good, but let me get a pen out instead. Uh, this, okay, here's B, here's B, here's B, and here's B. So you see they form like, okay, a connected subgraph of T. Okay, we can pick another vertex. I don't know if there's like an interesting vertex here, like maybe um, F. We look at all the bags that connect, contain it, and we see, oh, it's these ones. These three contain it. And that's connected, so great. OK, that's the whole definition. It's, it's a little bit complicated. It's a little bit hard to like, verify that this T has the property for all the edges. Each edge is in a bag. And like for every vertex, each uh, subtree of bags containing it is connected. Uh, and it's also hard to, like, it's not like immediately intuitive, given a graph G, how you would come up with such a T. Also, the T is not unique in any way. There are multiple tree decompositions possible for a given graph G. Okay, every graph can have uh, a tree decomposition. For example, given a graph G, you can just put like every single vertex into one bag and your whole tree is like one uh, vertex. It doesn't even have edges. It's just a big bag with all the vertices. That's allowed. But uh, as you might guess, you're trying to not do that. So um, the width of a tree decomposition is basically the maximum bag size. And then you put in minus one for a reason I'll say in a second. Okay, so the width of this tree decomposition is two because the maximum bag size is three. And yeah, generally you're hoping to, you know, given a graph G, like find a tree decomposition where the, um, the bags are as small as possible. Okay, and the smallest possible width is one because the smallest possible bag size is two. Because, you know, for all the edges, like an edge has to appear together in one bag. Okay, and so the, finally, the tree width of a graph G is defined to be the least possible width of a, a tree decomposition for G. So although this is not even the only tree decomposition for this G of width 2, uh, it is a tree decomposition for this uh, graph G of width 2. And in fact, you cannot do a tree decomposition for this graph of width one. So the tree width of this graph is indeed two. 
Okay, so uh, somewhat complicated definition. I mentioned why did I put this minus one in here, or why did they put this minus one in here? It's put in there so that uh, if G is a tree, its tree width is one. Okay, so trees have tree width one. Uh, so this decomposition is a, or this definition of tree width has like a long history. In some sense, this exact definition with the bags and the widths and so forth was first made by uh, Robertson and Seymour in 1986. Uh, but Arnborg and uh, Proskorowski defined um, an equivalent concept also around 1985, 1986. But then later people figured out that Hallen in 1976 had defined an equivalent concept and Bertelle and Brioski back in 72 had also defined an equivalent concept. So even though like it looks very complicated, like it must be natural if like everybody is converging on the same definition. Okay, so here I've just slightly summarized, uh, well, I've summarized and repositioned our facts about tree width, or our definition of tree width. And let me tell you some facts. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, fact one, as I mentioned, is trees have tree width one, okay? And the bags are just the edges. So let me show you an example. Here's a, a tree, G, and here's a tree decomposition for it. So you see, I took like this first edge, AC. I could have taken any edge, but I took AC and I made it a, a bag. And then I took AB and I made it a bag, okay? And I have to do all of A's edges here. Here I took AD and I made it a bag. I have to do all of edges here because of this rule that, you know, for every vertex like A, the bags that contain, contain it have to be connected in T. And then having done that, I was like, all right, I should also do C's edges because I've got C here. So I did C's edges and C's bags are here. And okay, it's not too hard to verify. You can do this for every tree, but width is one. Okay, good. So in general, like the tree width is supposed to somehow measure like how sort of similar-ish the graph is to being a tree. And the smaller, the better. Uh, actually, there's some more graphs that have tree width one, namely uh, forests. Okay, if you have like some disconnected trees, then they have tree width one. It's kind of a stupid, well, not stupid, but like generally we're not too concerned about disconnected graphs. But anyway, you have tree width one if and only if you're a forest. Uh, question from the audience. For point two, you mean that all, I'm reading the question, you mean that all the bags containing V lie on a single path in T? Uh, good point. They don't have to be on a path. Uh, maybe all the examples I've shown have shown a path, but it just has to be a subtree. It has to be a connected piece. Okay, so like the bags containing a vertex could look like, um, you know, this. Okay, maybe I haven't shown an example of what that occurs, but it doesn't have to be a path, it's just a subtree. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, another fact is you can say like, that's a nice characterization of tree width uh, one. Um, there's also a nice characterization of tree width two, or pretty nice. Uh, a graph has tree width two, if and only if, it's a subgraph of a series parallel graph. Okay, so series parallel graphs have tree width two, and any subgraph has uh, also tree width two, and this is all the tree width two um, graphs. It's, uh, this one is not incredibly easy to prove. The thing about tree width one is easy to prove, but the, the, this fact about tree width two is not easy to prove. And once you get to tree width three, there's no like catchy explanation of what a tree width three graph is. It's just, it is what it is. Okay, uh, let me cram a few more facts into the slide. I want to cram them on because, uh, you know, this, this definition is so long, it's good to have it up on the screen. So one other fact is that if you take a graph uh, with a certain tree width and then you delete some edges, it cannot increase the tree width. And actually that's very easy because if a tree dog decomposition for a graph and then you delete some edges from the graph, then your tree decomposition is still totally fine. You don't have to do anything to it because the only thing that deleting edges does is, you know, puts less restrictions on you. You know, they used to have to be, these edges you deleted used to have to be in a bag. You're still in some bag, but uh, they don't need to be anymore. Uh, it's also true, maybe this one's a little harder to see, but it's also true that if you take a graph and contract an edge, this also doesn't increase the tree width. I don't know if you remember or know what the definition of edge contraction is, but like basically if you have a graph and you have some edge in it, and you basically take the two endpoints of the graph uh, or edge, and you glue them together, and then you get rid of the self loop that's thereby formed. This sort of makes a smaller graph. Um, and this operation also does not increase tree width. That's a fact. 
And one more fact, which is not even, this one is also not totally immediate, but it's true. If you have a graph G uh, and you have some clique in it, then without too much effort, you can show that the entire clique has to be together in a bag. There's no way to split it up. And for example, as a consequence, if you have the complete graph on n vertices, like a clique on n vertices, uh, all those vertices, it has to be this trivial thing of just like, well, I put everything into one giant bag, and then that bag has n vertices, the tree width by definition is n minus 1. Okay, so tree width, that's sort of like the worst case. The worst possible tree width for an n vertex graph is n minus 1, and it occurs if the whole graph is a clique. Okay, great. I should emphasize that unlike in spectral graph theory, which might be on your mind from the homework, we're just considering like ordinary graphs without loops or multiple edges. Well, actually it's fine. I mean, series parallel graphs can naturally have multiple edges. So you get multiple edges. That also doesn't make a difference at all for the definition of tree width, right? For every edge, if it's together in some bag, then you can have lots of parallel edges and you're still satisfying this bullet point one. Okay, so actually, um, Tree width takes a while to get used to, and actually I'm going to spend some slides just like telling you more equivalent definitions of tree width. And I won't prove anything, um, but all these definitions are just sort of warm you up to tree width. And of course the point is going to be that, um, as we saw for like series parallel graphs and trees, as, as I will later, ex later explain, the point is that um, lots of problems on graphs or constraint satisfaction problems can be solved in polynomial time for uh, graphs that have constant tree width. Okay, so uh, shortest way to like kind of explain in quotation marks, like what is a tree width k graph? This is not precise, but I'll say some words that kind of more or less make it precise on the next slides. Is that like, what is a tree? You could think of like a tree is sort of formed by like you taking, you recursively, recursively glue together single vertices. Like you have a tree and then to make a new tree, you like introduce like a vertex, a single vertex and like glue it to a vertex, well, attach it by an edge to a vertex you already have. Or maybe you glue together a single edge onto the tree. You like keep grafting vertices onto the trees. Um, Series parallel graphs are kind of what you can get by like starting from like an edge and kind of like grafting on like uh, edges, like pairs of vertices. Um, that's, you know, Zolan quote, so that's like sort of true. And in some ways, like tree width k graphs are those you can get by like recursively gluing together like graphs like at k vertices. I'll say some things that uh, try to make this more precise. Okay, so in order to do, I want to make another definition for graphs. Um, a graph G is called chordal. If every cycle in the graph of length at least four has a chord, and what is a chord? It's an edge connecting two non-adjacent vertices on the cycle. So let me uh, get our favorite graph back out here. This is not a chordal graph uh, because for example, here's a cycle of length four and it has no chords. Well, yeah, it doesn't have a chord. Uh, for a chord, you'd need either the GA edge or the BD edge. Okay, so that's not a chordal graph. Uh, next definition, a triangulation of a graph is, it just refers to the process of adding edges to a graph in order to make it chordal. Okay, so if a graph is not chordal, it's sort of lacking chords, there's more than one way to do it, but you can put edges in to uh, make it chordal. So I'll give you an example for this graph just now. Uh, I've added three edges here, the yellow ones, and I've caused this graph to be chordal. Now, um, if you look at this graph, you might be like, wait, did you make a mistake? Because take a look at this cycle, G, this five cycle, G, D, C, F, uh, E, G. G, D, C, F, E, G. Yeah, it does have, uh, oh wait, sorry, that has a chord, okay. I, I made a mistake to my mistake. So uh, that indeed has a chord, but let's take a look at this uh, cycle um, from F, E, G, D. Okay, that is not like the greatest pen of all time, but look, take a look at this four cycle, F, E, G, D. It doesn't look like it has a chord, oh, but it actually does have a chord. This 
this edge here is the chord from F and G. It just is drawn outside, you know, the physical region, but graph theoretically, it's a chord. Let me try to clean that up. So just F, E, G, D is a cycle, but F, G is the chord. So this is a, now a chordal graph, and the process of adding these yellow edges is uh, called triangulation. Okay, so here's another fact about uh, tree width. Oh, wait, there's a question here. Does triangulation have to make triangles? Yeah, it effectively does because um, it basically you know, takes any cycle. In order to triangulate the cycle, you have to keep adding chords until like the, the only cycles that are left are like three cycles, i.e. triangles. So like it's uh, pictorially clearer here on this like four cycle down here. Whoops, oh, such great drawing. We took this four cycle and you know, we added this edge in the triangulation and now we have these three triangles, B, G, D and B, A, D. Okay, and if you stare long enough at this um, F, E, G, D, C, five cycle, first we added this yellow edge here, which gives us this triangle F, C, D. I mean, just hence the name. And then we still have this cycle D, F, E, G. And, but this edge F completes the triangulation. So we got three triangles, I guess, F, E, G, and uh, uh, should be D, F, G. Yeah, D, F, G is a triangle. Okay, so um, a graph has tree width at most K, if and only if it's possible to triangulate it, so the resulting triangulated graph has maximum clique size k plus one. Okay, so uh, just on this example here, this blue graph, we kind of knew it had tree width two, right? So it's supposed to have a triangulation where the maximum clique size is at most three. And that's true. If you stare at this graph, it does have some cliques of size three, the triangles, but it does not have any cliques of size four. Um, okay, so that's an explanation of it. So we, had we like triangulated in a bad way, I mean, you're allowed to like add this edge too uh, in your triangulation to get rid of, uh, to make sure every cycle has a chord. Had we done that, then okay, we would have had a K4 down here. I mean, a complete four vertex graph, uh, but we can get away without doing that. Um, okay. So that's a fact. In some sense, uh, what this means is that like chordal graphs are sort of maximal with respect to adding edges for their tree width. Okay, what, what that means is like, if you have a chordal graph and it has some tree width T, then, um, you know, adding uh, edges will make it no longer have, uh, you know, it'll increase its tree width. So chordal graphs are kind of like maximal tree width graphs for their tree width. And uh, another manifestation of that is like, here's a definition or a, a, a statement about chordal graphs. A graph G is chordal if it has a tree decomposition where every bag is itself a clique. Okay, and then these cliques, you know, in this situation, if the graph has tree width K, these cliques will have size uh, K plus one and they'll be making a bag and then the minus one will, you know, illustrate that you have tree width K. Okay, so that's another fact to kind of get you used to uh, this. And finally, uh, a graph is also chordal if it has what's called the perfect elimination ordering. And what is a perfect elimination ordering? Uh, it's a way to take the graph and go through the vertices in some order, such that when you, um, you kind of start with, uh, you kind of include the vertices into the graph one by one, and every time you include a new vertex, its edges should go to a clique. Okay, so that's not uh, super clear. Let me try to describe it here. So um, the perfect elimination ordering for this particular graph G, including these yellow chords, which is now a chordal graph, is exactly given by alphabetical order. I set it up A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, okay? So that means you start with H, okay, let me get, okay, you start with H and then you add G and G is, you know, connected to H and then you add F and when you add F, it has edges to a two clique. And when you add E in, 
It also has edges to a two clique. Okay, remember all these yellow edges are considered part of the graph. Okay, and then when you add D, uh, D has also edges to a two clique. The edges that it has sort of currently are to F and to G. And notice that F and G are indeed added by, uh, connected by an edge. And then when you add C in, it's connected to F and D. And indeed, D and F are connected by a two clique. And when you add B, it's got edges to D and G and uh, D. And when you add A, it's got edges to A and D, which are connected by edges. Okay. So um, this is for a uh, tree width two. Okay. And if you were talking about a tree width three graph with a uh, perfect elimination ordering, like every time you included a new vertex, it would have edges to a three clique that was already in the graph. Okay, so this is the, the sense, this is like the best sense in which like, um, you can say that like tree with K graphs kind of form by like attaching um, vertices and groups of K. So this perfect elimination ordering is like, so like a maximal tree width to graph, like this chordal graph here is formed by like, you know, you have a, a graph and like every time you add in a vertex, it has to have edges to a two clique that's already in the graph. Okay, and you, then you add another vertex that has an edge to a two clique in the graph and thereby making a three clique. And you add in like another vertex forming a three clique and another vertex forming a three clique. And that'll give you like a maximal tree width two graph, a chordal graph. And then finally to get all tree width, you know, two graphs, you take these constructions and now you're allowed to delete some edges. Okay, so that maybe is not immediately clear the first time you see it, and it's a little hard for me to get it across uh, in this, in this uh, PowerPoint session, but um, that's the story. Uh, any questions? Let me give you yet another, I mean, you know, because it's like kind of complicated, let me give you yet another equivalent definition of uh, tree width. And this is in terms of cops and robbers game. This is a technical term, cops and robbers. Uh, there's different kinds of cops and robbers games characterizing you know, different properties of graphs, but here I'll tell you one. So I'll explain it to you in words, but like the three or sort of rules of the cops and robbers games are that the robber is super fast and the cops are in helicopters and uh, the robbers can see the cop when it's trying to land. So what do I mean by this? So in this cops and robbers story, you, the graph is like, you know, like the game board or like some city streets and there's a robber and the robbers, you know, can start at some vertex. So like maybe the robber looks like an X. And uh, you have some number of cops. So like maybe in this game, I'll have uh, two cops. Okay. And the cops all are, have helicopters and they're like flying in the air. And like the cop, any cop can um, uh, land, you can pick a vertex and try to land on it. So maybe the cop in their helicopter is like, I'm gonna land on vertex B. And basically as the cop is landing, um, the robber is allowed to run if the robber wants. And the robber can even see where the cop is gonna land. And if the robber is there, it can like run away. Um, and the cops can also uh, leave a vertex. They can fly up in the air. You can imagine like, you know, the cops get a turn where every turn like they either land on a vertex and, or they have a helicopter go up in the air. And every time the cop does something, the robber is allowed to do something too. And of course the cops are trying to catch the robber, i.e. land a helicopter on top of the robber. Okay, so maybe like now the, the second cop will try to come in to vertex G. And as it's landing, the robber spots that and it can run uh, anywhere along the edges, but it cannot run through a place where a cop is. Okay, so uh, if we, this cop really landed here on B, then the robber could run down from G to D. Okay, and now we have a cop at B and a cop at G. And now maybe one of them, maybe the cop at B will like fly up into the air, whoops, and try to uh, catch the robber at D. But as the, they're landing, the cop is landing at D, the robber, so now we have a cop here, but the robber can like run away. Maybe they'll run to C and so forth. So actually you can tell in this graph, I think it's not too hard to tell that like two cops cannot catch the robber. Like the robber can always evade them. But it's a theorem that in any graph, the tree width is at most K, if and only if K plus one cops can win the game. Okay, so we know this graph has tree width two, which means it should be that three cops can win this game. And it's not hard to tell that uh, three cops can indeed win this game uh, on this particular graph. And in fact, you can kind of get the strategy for the cops 
um, out of the 3D composition. This is the 3D composition for this graph. Actually, it's not the same one I showed before because I was intentionally showing like uh, an over elaborate one before, but like this is also, I mean, I had some junk hanging off here, but this is also a valid 3D composition for this graph. And uh, I'll just illustrate how the cops win here by like looking at this 3D composition. So B, D, and G are like where the cops should go first. So like, you know, the cops will go to like B and G and uh, uh, D. Okay, and while they're doing this, the robber, you know, can run around wherever the robber likes. But okay, this is gonna be the cops first move. So let's say the robbers, um, you know, decide to land on E, okay? So now, uh, the, you know, the cops look at this diagram, they see like E is down here, so they're going to go into this piece of the tree, uh, which is root of DFG, which basically means they're going to try to change their position to DFG, so this cop at B is going to fly up into the air and go to F. And you can see that's kind of a smart strategy for the cops, right? So like this cop at B is going to go away, it's up in the air, and the robber can run around if it wants, but you see G and D are blocking it from getting into this piece of the graph. So the robber can only run around like this F, H, E, C, etc. So maybe the robber runs to X and the cop comes down at F. So now we have a cop at F as well. Okay, and now the cops say, oh, look, the robber went to C. So we'll find out where C is. Here it is. And so we can just go directly down here and we should pick up, we should get rid of G and have G go to C. And indeed, that's a smart move. It's pointless for the cops to hold on to G now. So this cop in the helicopter at G will fly up into the air. C can run around, but it's like blocked by F and D, and now the cop can land on its head and win the game. Okay, so that's like actually like a fun way to try to understand what uh, the tree width of graph is. It's like also nice to imagine, you can think about like, why is it the case that in a tree, which has tree width one, two cops can always win? Well, you know, you land a, like a cop down, the tree robber has to go into sub, sub tree, one of the two sub trees hanging off where the, the cop is. And then whichever subtree it goes into, like the second cop will fly like, you know, just like one edge down in the direction of the robber and the cops will keep like moving down edges and catch the robber. Okay, so uh, one direction of this proof is easy, uh, that if the tree width is at most K, then K plus one cops can win. Basically, you just have to make precise this thing, I, this story I told you about the cops using the tree decomposition as a strategy. On the other hand, the other uh, direction proved by Robertson and Seymour that if uh, K plus one cops can win, then the graph has tree width at most K. That's pretty hard. It takes a, it took them a paper. Shortish paper, but a paper. So uh, one nice corollary of this is it helps you understand uh, the tree width of grids. And actually grids play a very important role in the study of tree width, as I'll indicate on this slide. So one thing you can, so this is a five by five grid over here and a three by three grid down here. I put them up just for you to have something to stare at while I'm talking. Um, so if you have a G by G grid, uh, you can see from this copper and robbers game that it's tree width has to be at least G minus one. So why is that? Well, if you only have G minus one, okay, so suppose uh, for contradiction that this G by G grid had tree width G minus two, then G minus two plus one, AKA G minus one cops could win. But a G minus one cannot, cops cannot win on a G by G graph. Because if you have G minus one cops, like, you know, if I have four cops here, they're always gonna leave open some, well, I guess I used circles for cops before. They're always gonna leave open some row and some column. So maybe you have the cop here and here, you know, no matter where they are, there's gonna be some open row and some open column. I guess maybe like here, and the robber can sit on this X. And basically the cops, you know, the robbers can always easily uh, go to this open row and column. Uh, okay, so in fact, uh, well, as a little exercise for you, this argument is not quite sharp. Uh, the tree width of a G by G grid is actually G. So as an exercise for you, you should prove that in fact, even G cops cannot win in a G by G graph. Okay, and so if you have this little three by three graph here, apparently even three cops cannot win in this game. And it's not too hard to see, at least in this example of, let's say you have a cop here, here, and here. Um, okay, and the robber is sitting at the center. Okay, well, when one of the cops flies up into the air, like maybe this cop flies up in the air in an attempt to land on the robber in the middle, well, the robber sees that it's coming down at the middle, the robber can run to, 
Uh, well, a variety of places it can run here, for example. Okay, you need a slightly more sophisticated robber strategy in order to make this work, but I leave that as an exercise for you. Uh, okay, so what's interesting though is that um, this is what you know some people would judge to be a pretty simple graph, like a grid graph. It's like a pretty easy graph. Like it's planar. In fact, it has maximum degree four too. Yet it can have like arbitrary sort of large uh, tree width. So you know we have this uh, G by G grid is a degree four planar graph, and the tree width is square root the number of vertices. So it just goes to show that there are you know relatively simple graphs that still have quite large um, tree width. And there are actually converses to this theorem that basically show if you have a large tree width graph, it must be because there's some kind of embedded grid in the graph. So this was first proved by Robertson Seymour with not very good parameters and then subsequently improved in like the uh, 21st century by several papers involving Julia Chujoy, the most recent of which is Chujoy and Tan from 2019, which shows the following. Oh, there's some straight comma here. I can erase that. If you have a graph with tree width t, then g um, must quote unquote contain a g by g grid in it, a full g by g grid, where g is like t to the 0.11, t to the 1 ninth. Uh, and what does contain mean? It doesn't literally mean contain, but it means contains at a mi as a minor. If you know this uh, terminology, it means you can get the grid from your graph by deleting vertices, deleting edges, and contracting edges. Okay, so, um, you know, it's like that, you know, famous Kortowski theorem that like a planar graph, uh, you're a planar graph if and only if you don't like contain a copy of uh, K33 or K5. It's again the same sense of contain by deleting uh, vertices, deleting and contracting edges, okay? So this kind of shows that like having large grids inside you is like exactly the barrier to having small tree width, okay? And they got like even a polynomial relationship between these two parameters.